Praise the Lord. We'll stand up as we pray to the Lord before the Bible study. Would you want to commit yourself to the Lord? That as you come to the Bible study today, that the blessing of the Lord, the riches of the word, will come to your heart, apply it to your life, and the grace to keep the word of God, the grace to obey, and the grace to do, exactly as he teaches us, that the Lord will help you today. And you will actually be a doer of the word. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. That the Lord today will help you. You will not just be a hearer of the word. But you will be a doer of the word. And the grace of God will so enrich your life. That this word you will keep. And you'll keep it from your heart, keep it with your life, and do exactly as it teaches. You'll keep the word in all sincerity, without hypocrisy. It will not be lip service, it will be life service. That has come week after week. Monday after Monday That this word will make your life more gracious More loving More compassionate That your life will point to Christ Who loved us so much and loved you so much And has saved you from your sin That every action Every attitude, every disposition will demonstrate the love of God shed abroad in your heart, flowing into the lives of all people around you. Give God a chance to walk in your life and be a symbol, a trophy. Of the very grace of God. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father we bless your name tonight. For another Bible study. This is the word of life. The bread of life. And Lord we pray. Evermore give us this bread. That we may live and have that abundant life. In Jesus name. Amen. We know that you are the word personified Because your word says in the beginning was the word And the word was with God and the word was God He came to dwell among us But now you want to even live in our heart Lord we pray that this blessed word This wonderful word This living word Will live mighty and powerful In every one of our hearts in Jesus name That's as your word puts love in our heart, mercy, grace, and compassion will go back home and live in our communities. They will know that the love of God is now enriching our lives, flowing to all our neighbors. Lord, we pray you open the pages of the scriptures to us tonight. The things we knew before which we have forgotten, remind us again. And the things that we have never heard, we have never known, show them to us in Jesus' name. Bless your people tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down with your Bible in your hand. You open to Matthew chapter 5. The Lord has brought us together so that we'll be able to share the mind of God. We'll be able to receive of the very nature of God. We've been in this Matthew chapter 5. And I need to tell you, I'm sure you know this already. That Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7 is actually referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And that Sermon on the Mount is talking about the life. Of the citizens of the kingdom. Let me show you. That in every one of these chapters. Chapter 5. Chapter 6. And chapter 7. It talks about the kingdom. 
which tells you then everything you read about from the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount until the very edge is talking to us. It says, when you come into the kingdom, this is how you live. It's a higher kingdom. It's a better kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. And when you become born again, because Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see. Neither can he enter into the kingdom of God. Then when you enter through that gate of the new birth, you confess your sin. You forsake your sin. And there's a mighty change, a new change that comes upon you. Because as you know, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, and if any man be in the kingdom of Christ, is a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. That new life of the kingdom. For the citizens of the kingdom. That's what we're learning. Look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. But I say unto you. That except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's talking about kingdom life. Immediately he said that and he, he told the people as he's telling us that our righteousness, the holiness we profess, the uprightness and the lifestyle we demonstrate must be higher and greater and go farther, deeper than the life of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he says it's only then. We are in the kingdom. After he said that, he began to tell them in practical terms. Verse 21. Ye have heard, it was said by them of old time. Thou shalt not kill. Verse 22. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother. You know, it goes on like that. It says, your righteousness must exceed. The righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And then he begins to tell us this is what it was in the old covenant. This is what it was in the old kingdom. Now in this kingdom, the kingdom of Christ. It says, you have heard it was said by them of all time. Thou shalt not kill. But now as you enter through the new birth into the kingdom of God I'm telling you that you should not even be angry you should have love then he goes on in verse 27 ye have heard it was said by them of old time thou shalt not commit adultery that's the, that's the limitation of the old kingdom old covenant in verse 28 but I say unto you that whosoever shall look on a woman to lost after her has committed adultery with her already in the heart. It says, this new kingdom is a higher kingdom, a greater kingdom, a better kingdom, a richer kingdom. Having the abundance of the grace of God. Still telling us about kingdom life. In verse 31, it has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife. Let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you. That two servers shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. You see what he's telling us? He's telling us, come out of the old and come into the new. And then be begin to think about the kingdom, the standard of the kingdom, the spirituality of the kingdom, the love we have, the affection we have in the kingdom. And then he tells us in verse 33 again, ye have heard, it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, and shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths, but I say unto you, the king of the kingdom is talking to the citizens of the kingdom. And you love the king, you love the kingdom. And you say, yes, this is the new principle of life by which we're to live. Then he goes on in verse 38, ye have heard, ye have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. 
You know, those people of the old covenant, they lived by the principle of retaliation. Hit me, I hit you. Throw a stone at me, I throw another stone at you. You send some evil to me in the old covenant, you send it back to the sender in the old covenant. He said, you have heard, this is how they operated in the old covenant. Then he says, in this new covenant, in the kingdom of Christ, in verse 39, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil. Just live your life as if the evil is not there. As if the hatred is not there. Live your life as if the contradictors and the people, the opposers, the gainsayers, as if they were not there. Live your life dead to self. That whatever they do, whatever they say, however they act, receives she not evil. We covered that ground in the last study. Now we come to the study of today in verse 43. He's still continuing the same thing. He's still telling us the life of the kingdom. He's still telling us the principles of living by the citizens of the kingdom. And he tells us in this verse 43, Ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Did you ever hear that? Which other kingdom? Which other tradition? In which other religion? Any religion in the world? Where, where did you hear? Love your enemies. Have you thought about all those personalities of the old covenant? Did they operate generally by this principle of the kingdom of God? Love your enemies. Have you been in another religion before you came to Christ? In that other religion, in that other tradition, did you hear love your enemies? When you were growing up, did you hear from daddy and mommy? Love your enemies. When you went to school, and those uh, people taught you from the civics and from the history and from the political science, did they tell you, love your enemies? When you went for training as a professional force man, did you hear in your training, love your enemies? This is kingdom life. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, the king of the kingdom. And he says, this is what used to happen. Many people lived by the law of retaliation and revenge. But it will not be so among you because now when the kingdom of God. And he says, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. This is going to take the grace of God. And that's what we have when you come into the kingdom. That somebody is cursing you insulting you abusing you wishing you evil and you from the depth of your heart in all sincerity you desire and you pray for him to be blessed bless them that curse you kingdom life and then it says do good to them that hate you this must be kingdom life there's no other place you can find this except in Christ. And except among the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, pray for them. Which despitefully use you and persecute you. As we look at this, and we need to understand to start with. You know, we always talk about this. That those Pharisees and the scribes, they mutilated the word of God. They misinterpreted the word of God. They misapplied the word of God. I told you that before. And you see, they will try to take a little bit of scripture and sprinkle their opinions and ideas in that little scripture. And by the time it comes out of their hand and they're telling you it's all different from the word of God. And look at it in verse 43. Ye have heard that has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor there's an omission there there's an omission there as thyself they omitted that 
You see, that's what the people do. They'll quote the Bible to you. And then they'll omit a little thing. And then you might even justify yourself. I am doing that. Number one, there's omission. Number two, there's addition. The addition is, and thou shalt hate thine enemy. And omission, as I said, they didn't put that. They just said, love your, no, love your neighbors. My neighbor is saying, you know, doing this and that. Well, love your neighbors. How do I love my neighbors? Go and think about that as much as I want to love them. But Jesus said, and the whole Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. And then they added this other one now. And this is human nature. Human nature. There are many things that human nature will add if you are not careful. Human nature will add something that will cancel even the other one you are trying to hold on to. Human nature added and hate thine enemy. Terrible. And you see, you could listen to those people and follow that all through your life. And when you get to the end of life, you're not able to get to the kingdom. Because to get to the kingdom, you need to listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I say unto you, was well, he looking around and looking at Peter, James, John, Matthew, his followers? And he says, you fishermen that you have decided to follow me, I say unto you. Was well, he looking eyeball to eyeball, face to face with some people there who just got up away from what they were doing and they were following Christ. And he looked at them and he said, behold, I say unto you, love your enemies. Well, the, the problem even is more than what I've read to you. The, those people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they define those words in some limited ways. First of all, the word neighbor. The word neighbor. Love thy neighbor. Even if we stop at, stop at that, they, they are going to ask, but who is my neighbor? And from the life story of Jesus and the writings of the Gospels, you will see the way they define the neighbor. And then, you know, somebody wanted to justify himself. These uh, people that came to Christ. And then when Jesus said, you know the commandments. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then to justify himself, he said, but who is my neighbor? Why was he asking that question? Only his tribes people were his neighbor. He did not count the Samaritans as his neighbor. He did not count the Gentiles as his neighbor. And so, once he loved an Israelite like himself, he thought he had fulfilled the law of God. That's why he said, but who is my neighbor? And then Jesus told the story of the good Samaritan. And then after telling the story, he said, this Samaritan you are counting as an enemy, as a stranger, as a foreigner, somebody that does not have any part in the commonwealth of Israel, see what he has done. Now tell me, who is a neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? And then the other fellow has to answer. Has to answer. It's the good Samaritan. Go and do likewise. They misunderstood who a neighbor was. Also, they misunderstood the enemies. They misunderstood the enemies. You see, they had a concept. If you read the Old Testament, you'll find that God said, Go into that Canaan. And the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Hivites exterminate them, wipe them off from the face of the earth. Now, those are not their personal enemies. They are the enemies of God. And because they were enemies of God, you know, they applied that. And because of all the wars they saw in the Old Testament, you destroy the Philistines. You destroy all those enemies of God. But we're talking about your personal enemy and because of that misconception of who an enemy was because of that they misapplied the whole word of god it's like what i told you last in the last study the thing that ought to be for the magistrate for the judiciary they applied it personally unto themselves but the lord is telling us is dealing with personal enemy not public enemies you know, people commit crime and then the government will take them and put them in the prison. Not that fellow that committed crime is not a personal enemy to the president 
of a king is a public enemy is an enemy of mankind and therefore you deal with that in a separate way but now we're talking about not the enemy of the public not the enemy of mankind not even the enemy of god you know there are enemies of god that's a different issue not the enemy of righteousness that's a different issue this is a personal enemy let me show you in acts of the apostles chapter 13 acts of the apostles chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 10 and said oh full of all subtlety and all mischief thou child of the devil thou enemy of all righteousness that's a different thing that's a different thing this man was not a personal enemy to paul the apostle this is an enemy of all righteousness. Will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Look at Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 18. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and I'll tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of christ not a personal enemy that one is different so there's a difference between those canaanites those jebusites those hivites those amalekites those who are the enemies of god and when you come onto the new testament you find the same thing and you know sometimes you'll wonder and you'll say jesus said love your enemies and then in matthew chapter 23 he said woe unto you scribes and pharisees because you shut up the kingdom of God and they who want to enter, you don't allow them to enter. Then you say, I'm confused. Jesus said, love your enemies, bless them that cause you do good to them, that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. And now Jesus Christ is saying, woe unto uh, these Pharisees. You know what he said? He said, they shut the kingdom of God. Enemies of the kingdom. Those who are enemies of mankind. They didn't want people to enter into the kingdom of God. That's a different issue. It's not talking about your own enemy. Not enemy of mankind. Not enemies of God. Not the enemies of the cross of Christ. Not the enemies of the kingdom. Come back now to Matthew chapter 5. And look at this verse 44. Matthew chapter 5. Looking at verse 44. Here is what Jesus taught his own disciples. And if we are one of the disciples of Jesus Christ, here is what the Lord is teaching you. He says, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Who is an enemy then? An enemy is somebody who is unfriendly, an unfriendly opponent, somebody who hates you, somebody who seeks to harm you, who seeks to cause trouble for you. And our Lord commands such enemies, love them. An enemy is somebody who fights against another person in combat or in battle. And the Lord says, love your enemies. An enemy is someone who is hostile, has malice and is hostile to you and he has a plan and a purpose to hurt you and to harm you and the true child of god is commanded to love them and in that passage i've read to you it tells us what those enemies will do number one they curse number two they hate number three they despise you number four they persecute you number five they are evil number six they are unjust number seven they will not even salute you but you have to salute them you have to greet them and so these are the enemies and but you know something is uh, you need to read the bible in a balanced way let me read this to you again matthew chapter 5 verse 44 but i say unto you love your enemies don't hate them love them don't fight them love them don't flee from them love them uh, you know the lord does not want us to be cowards uh, there's something to uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to love it's another thing to be like a jellyfish very much afraid not having faith 
You have to read the whole Bible. You must have love. You must have faith. Have faith in love that will give you courage. You are not afraid of the enemy. You just love him. In fact, you love him because you know he cannot hurt you. There's nothing he can do. And all things work together for good for them that love God who are called according to his purpose. And because he has given you power over every power of the enemy, he cannot really do anything. He cannot hurt you. Therefore, you love him. And then he says, don't retaliate, don't revenge, just love him. He said, don't criticize, don't complain, don't go about saying, see what so and so is doing to me. The oppression is too much. The difficulty is too much. Don't complain. Cowards complain. Courageous people take their stand. But while you are taking your stand and you are courageous, you have, you have the mind of steel. You have the mind of a courageous person. And yet there is love. It says love your enemies. Don't give up and don't give in. You know, when enemies confront us, and when enemies oppose us, and when enemies come at us, they, they think, you know what they want, and the likelihood is you give up, you just throw up everything. This is too much, I cannot endure this. And then you give in, don't give in, don't give up, but love them. To love them doesn't mean that you fall down and then you become their doormat. No, you still love them. You have mercy on them. You have compassion on them. Love them, but don't give up. And don't give in. Don't compromise, but love. You see, it's, it's not telling us to give up our Christian faith and to compromise. They're putting the pressure on you, those enemies, because they want you in particular to backslide. You say, no. I will love you, but I will not compromise. And then, don't fear them. Jesus said, don't fear anyone. I will tell you, whom you will fear, you fear God who has power to destroy both the soul and the body and drag it to hell. And then he said, I say unto you, fear him, but don't fear any man. You are of more value than the sparrows. Don't fear them, but love them. That's what the Lord is telling us. This study is not to make us a coward. It's not to make us like, you know, amphibians, not having any backbone. It's not to make us compromise us. Just, you know, lie down and let those enemies, you know, walk on you and destroy. No, it's just to love them. And it is that love that shows you are strong. Hate shows that you are weak. If you retaliate, that shows you are weak. If you fight back, that shows you are weak. But if you are able to stand and you love, that is the strength of the Christian life. I divide the study tonight to three parts. Number one, sincere love for neighbors and enemies. Sincere love for neighbors and enemies. Number two, sacrificial love for enemies. A specified love for our enemies Specified love for our enemies Number three is sacrificial love In evangelizing the enemies Number one Sincere love for neighbors and enemies Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 and 44 It says ye have heard that it has been said Love thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. We have seen that is not in the word of God. In verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. And then it says, pray for them, we despitefully use you and persecute you. And we learned something here. The love Jesus was talking about was not sentimental love. Does the feeling? No, it's not feeling. It's a love that gets something done. It's a love in action. And what is that love? The love that blesses them, those enemies. The love that does good to them. And then the love that prays for them. Is this totally new to the New Testament? Not at all. If you look at Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. We're looking at verse 17. Leviticus 19 17 it says thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart not even in your heart 
not even in your heart. Uh, there must not be any kind of stain of hatred. You know, hatred weakens your spiritual personality. Hatred distorts your personality. Hatred even confuses you. Hatred shuts up your brain. You cannot think right or think straight when you are motivated and influenced and controlled, oppressed by hatred. So the Lord said, even in the Old Testament, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge. Any grudge. What does that mean? Small grudge. Passing grudge. Temporary grudge. Permanent grudge. Deep-seated grudge. Any grudge. Thou shalt not bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. That's what the Lord is commanding us and saying that we have a responsibility towards our neighbor. And it's the responsibility of love. And this must be sincere love. Not hypocritical love. It's not just love by word of mouth. Neighbor, I'm a Christian. Of course, I love you. And in your heart, there's a different tune. There's a different thing that is stirring up in the heart. It must be love without dissimulation, without hypocrisy. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. No pretense, no hypocrisy, no insincerity. Let it be sincere love from your heart for everyone and now for your enemies. Abhor that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. And then it says in honor preferring one another. Let's look at Mark. In Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 verse 32. In Mark chapter 12 verse 32. And the scribes said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God. And there is none other but he. Here was somebody talking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ has, had already declared to him the great law in the word of God. To love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And then to love your neighbor as yourself. And then the fellow replied and said, Lord, I agree with that. I agree with that. Thou hast said well. Because... To love God, in verse 33 now, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole bunch offerings and sacrifices. That's what the man said. What did Jesus tell the man in verse 34? And Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, and he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You are not there yet, but you are not far. You have not entered yet, but you are not far. What's the meaning of this? Knowing about loving our enemies, that's good. That knowledge is good. But you are not in the kingdom yet just because you know it. You are in the kingdom because you do it. The man replied, Jesus, and he said, yes, I agree. In total, like they say, all together, that to love God with all your heart and then to love your neighbor as yourself is better than all the sacrifices of religion. And Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom. Get born again and get into the kingdom. Just knowing it in the head. Just coming to the Bible study. Just looking at all these verses of scripture and just knowing them, coaching them, teaching them even. And explaining them to people is not enough. If you just know it, you are not far. You have enough knowledge to get in, but you are not in yet. Get in and then begin to do it and love your neighbor as yourself. And love your enemies as well. And let's go to Luke chapter, chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 27. 
And you see Luke is actually writing about the same thing, but it shows you that what Matthew wrote was not just a personal, private, secret opinion. It was what Jesus actually said. Because we read in Luke chapter 6 verse 27. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. If they are ten, love all your enemies. If some, you have some in the village, some in the city, some in your community, wherever they are, love all your enemies. You know, sometimes we make a, a kind of calibration, a kind of degrees of, of uh, you know, hatred or enemies. Say, this one is a mild enemy. I think I can endure this one. I can love this one. This one is uh, is gone so far. You know what he did to me? Do you know what he said about me? Some unprintable words that he threw at me. This one is terrible, all right? This enemy, I will love him. That enemy, I love him. This one, no. No way. I can love this one. Jesus said, love your enemies, all of them. Whatever they said, whatever they did, whichever curse they pronounced, don't you know, their curse actually means nothing. There is no enchantment against the people of God. No weapon that is formed against us can prosper. Am I right? If they curse, they are wasting their saliva. They are wasting their time. And since the sin is not even going to catch you, why are you hating them? Why would you hate them? When all their, all their enmity, all their harassment, all their pressure, all their opposition will mean nothing, you will still get to where you are going to get to. And the promises of God will see the yes and amen in your life. And therefore, they don't understand. That's why they're, they're doing what they're doing. Because what they're doing cannot remove any little bit in the progress and the accomplishment the Lord wants to have in life. And therefore, since all that they do actually does not matter, why don't you just forget and forgo and just love them all the same? In that Luke chapter 6, verse 27, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Do good to them which hate you. And look up here. It's like, you know, if you, you are here now in this country, and in that country where you are, you are listening to me today. Let's think about the president of America. And he has, uh, you know, one of his uh, children, one of the daughters. Let's say in your heart now. Yeah, Christian, you shouldn't do that. But I'm just, you know, for illustration. Let's say you have hatred against the daughter of the president of America. He just said, I, I hate her. You see a picture in the, in the newspaper and say, I hate her. The hatred you have over here, how will it affect her over there? You waste your time. You waste your time. And therefore, if she happens to know about you, since you cannot throw a stone from here, that will reach her where she is. And whatever you say to your neighbor about her, is not going to touch her where she is. The hatred, your hatred for her means nothing. What I'm saying is, you are a child of the king. And you are a child of the king of kings. And whoever hates you in his private heart, what's that going to do to you? Whatever they say, you know, in their houses, they talk against you and they say this and that. Even if you heard, what will that do against you? Since their hatred means nothing. And their causes mean nothing. And their negative action and untrusts mean nothing. And you still live your life. And you still enjoy all the goodness of God. There's nothing for you to react to. Don't be reactive. Be proactive. Be positive in your action. And Jesus said, since all those people actually, whatever they do, whatever they say, mean nothing. He then says, love them. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them which curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. In verse 35, but love your enemies. Saying it again, saying it again the second time. He said it in verse 27. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great 
and ye shall be the children of the highest for he is kind unto the, un unto the unthankful and the evil we will love our enemies and you know then that, that makes us the real children of God it means that you are born again and loving your enemies is a demonstration that the grace of God is now in your life in John chapter 14 verse 15 John 14 verse 15 if you love me keep my commandments Jesus said if you love me keep my commandments you know every time you allow hatred in your heart towards a so-called enemy your love for Christ is called into question every time you manifest a negative attitude towards somebody in your yard in your community in your house and you have this negative attitude and then you just see them there and you're thinking mr a did this against me and then mrs b did this against me and you just get you see them there you are kind of thinking each over and their pictures come before you how could somebody do this to an innocent person like me and you get into self-pity then you'll not be able to love them and if there's any good you ought to do to them you'll not do good to them every time you see them your, your mind is thinking you allow the old nature to take over your life you allow the old kind of mindset to take over your life and instead of finding some good thing you can do to them that will lift their hearts and their lives up you're thinking of an evil thing you can do and then you dishonor christ and your love for christ is called into question but if you love the lord here is the commandment of the lord he said love your enemies look at that again john chapter 14 verse 15 if you love me if if you truly love the Lord keep my commandments will keep the commandments of the Lord I come to point number two now and point number two specified love for our enemies specified love for our enemies in Matthew chapter 5 I'm reading from verse 44 but I say unto you love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you there is you know you will lo you love the lord jesus christ i love the lord jesus christ but you know i, I love him because uh, when he when he speaks he doesn't leave us in doubt he tells us exactly what we're to do it says love your enemies and then it begins to tell us point one point two point three this is how to love because you see there are some people may go beyond and go at it an edge and then they fall into a cliff and they make the love so broad and they make the love so deep and they make the love so high higher than what jesus christ intended let me tell you this when we talk about love there are degrees of love there are heights of love just like there are degrees of grace there are heights of grace just like there are degrees of faith and there are heights of faith the same way for example it says you love your god with all your heart all your soul all your mind that's the greatest kind of love do you know the lord expects you to love god God more than you love your father, your mother, your children, your neighbors, everybody. That's a higher kind of love. That you love God higher, above every scene on earth. Not only that, do you know the Lord expects you to love Christ who died for you on the cross of Calvary more than anybody on earth, more than anything on earth. It's a higher kind of love. You see Peter and the rest of the people went to the seashore and peter said i go a fishing that night he caught nothing it was after the resurrection of the lord jesus christ and then jesus came to them he said children have you any meat and they said no then he told them throw your nets there for a catch and then when they threw their nets they caught a great number of fish actually somebody was counting 153 and then somebody said that must be christ anywhere he goes there's a miracle he went about doing good he's come to do good to us and then they, they came to the shore and they brought all the all the fish and then jesus said come and dine and after they had eaten with him he said 
Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? A higher kind of love. You see, when we talk about loving the enemy, it's not talk, it's not saying love the enemy like you love God. No, there must be a difference. It's not saying love your enemies like you love Christ who died for you on the cross. No, love for Christ a higher kind of love. In fact, it's not telling you to love your enemy as you love your wife, as you love your husband. That, that other love for wife and husband is a higher kind of love than this one we're talking about. You must understand the specific love. That's why we call it specified love for our enemies. As you, let me just show you some references of the Bible for you to know that this love we're talking about, there are categories and grades and degrees and heights of love. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15, I'm reading to you from verse 13. John chapter 15 verse 13, it says, greater love as no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Greater love. That's a great, great, great love. Greater love. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2, reading there from verse 4. Here we are told of a great love for God who is rich in mercy and for his great love wherewith he loved us. There's a greater love, there's great love. And now there is love. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. Romans 5 verse 8, but God commended his love toward us. Greater love, great love, and then love. I'm sure you know that the Lord expects you that you love God more than you love any other person here on earth. That you love Christ more than you love any other person here on earth. And then your love for your family your love for people that are very close to you and your love for the brethren what love is that wonderful love we're commanded then to love our enemies and that love is specified and well defined and well described by christ what kind of love come back to matthew chapter matthew chapter 5 matthew chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. What's the description of that love? Bless them that curse you. That's all. Bless them that curse you. Then do good to them that hate you. And then pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's the limitation of the love. That is the description of the love. That is a specification of the love you are to have for your enemies. Now, it tells us that we are to bless them when they curse. That what means speak well of them when they speak evil of you. Don't slander them. They will slander. They will curse. They will try to annoy you. Don't annoy them. Just bless them. And then it says, do good unto them, though they hate you. That is, you are not to harbor any form of hatred in your heart towards your enemies. You are just to love them. You, know, you will not like their character. You will not like their evil. To like, that's a different thing. You are not supposed to like them. You are supposed to love them. It's like, you know, uh, you give a, a particular pill to a child. And he says, Daddy, I don't like this pill. I'm sure my son, you don't like it. You need to love it. Because this will give you energy. This will help you. This will take the pain, the problem away. You, you don't like it. Love it. You know, you go to school. Daddy, I don't like that teacher. Yes, love him and love his subject. It's not that you like. You know, when somebody is throwing something at you, you won't like that. When somebody is hurting you, you will not like that. Liking is different. But you love. And you love because Jesus said, love your enemies. Whether you like what they do or not, you appreciate what they do or not. That's another thing. If somebody is abusing you, you will not appreciate that. 
We know that. If somebody is hurting you, I mean, you're not appreciated, but you love. Because, you know, it's a creature of God. And you see that if I can pray for him, he'll come into the hands of the Almighty God and the Lord will change his life eventually. Love him. Love him and do these wonderful things for him. Let's look at other passages of scripture that tells us how to express our love, practical love to our enemies. In Proverbs chapter 25, Proverbs chapter 25, reading from verse 21. If then any may be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of water upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Look beyond what the enemy is doing, and look at the great reward. The great reward you are, you are going to have. It says, if you will do this and feed your enemy when he's hungry and give him water to drink, to quench and satisfy his thirst. It says, then the Lord will see that action, that you actually are acting as a child of God and the Lord will reward you for it. And there are times you say, I'm fed up. I will not do good to those people anymore. The more good I do to them, the more evil they do to me, and the more they hurt me. Don't look at their hurt. Look at the reward that is coming ahead. The Lord said, if you'll feed the hungry, the hungry that hate you. If you will give them water to drink and do some good in their lives, he says, the Lord will reward you. The Lord will reward you. Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 23, Exodus chapter 23, we're reading from verse 4, Exodus chapter 23, as you look at this you'll see that even in the Old Testament they were told how they ought to act and react to their enemies, Exodus 23 verse 4, Neither shall die, not, it says, if, if thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. You see that attitude? That's doing good. Your enemy is losing something. And you know that that thing will be lost if you, don't, if you don't grab that thing and take it back to him. You do good to him and take it back to him. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his body, thou would, and thou wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help him. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, it's still telling us in a very descriptive manner and in a very concrete way how we're to relate with our enemies, what we're to do. Look at verse 14, chapter 12, verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Oh, you say, but I know some people who don't do that. It's not who you know. We're talking about what you ought to do if you're a Christian. If you're a child of God. Get into the kingdom of God is a personal decision. It's not a community decision, a corporate decision. I know some people who carry the Bible and they don't bless the people that cause them. Don't worry about them. Your own decision, your own lifestyle is what matters. That's what tells us where you are going to spend eternity. And the Lord says that you are to bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Then he says rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that do weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. After hearing the word of God, you know there are some people that will modify what they hear. I hear what they are saying. But they don't understand. They don't understand people in our house. They don't understand the wife of the landlord. If they understood the wife of the landlord and what she does to me, they won't be talking the way they are talking. And so after hearing the word of God, you become wise in your own conceits. You then make your opinion higher your own ideology higher than the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
But it says, Be not wise in your own conceits. In verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Recompense to no man evil for evil. That's the life of an animal. That's the life of a beast. That's the life of somebody that doesn't have grace, no touch, no transformation by the Lord. But when you know the Lord, it says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Be provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. That's the evidence you know the Lord. And if any kind of fight is going to begin, it will not originate from you. If any disagreement or conflict is going to take place, it will not originate from you. There is nothing in you that loves trouble, that loves violence, that loves conflict, that loves fighting. It will never originate from you. As much as lies in you, you will seek of doing good unto other people. And you'll seek of saying nice, nice, kind things to other people. It says, if it be possible, as much as lies in you, you live peaceably with all men. Therely, beloved, avenge not yourselves. When does vengeance come? When somebody has done something to you. This one touches your personality. This one touches your self-esteem. Doesn't this fellow know that, you know, somebody will feel inferior if you do this to him? If you're always cutting the man down, you cut him from below, you cut him from above, you cut him psychologically and physically. Don't they know that it makes you feel small? Don't worry about that. Just live big in your heart. It's not what they do. It's because of who they belong to. The person they belong to, the devil, that's how he influences them. If they act with the action of the man, of the devil, they belong to you, act to show who you belong to, that you belong to the Lord. Therefore, you do not avenge yourself, rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, in verse, in verse 20, if an enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. What does that mean? Be not overcome of evil. You are supposed to be a child of God. An upright child of God. A compassionate child of God. A loving child of God. And normally when nothing bad happens, you are normally nice. When, when, when nothing happens to kind of distract you or destroy you or depress you, you are normally kind, merciful, and compassionate. And now somebody does evil to you. And you begin to think about that evil. And you begin to look at that person. You're not looking at him as if you should pity him. And really you should pity him. If somebody is, you know, a human being, and he behaves like an animal and he wants to destroy his neighbor wants to destroy you and then you look at yourself i've done nothing wrong to this man and he's doing this to me you pity him because he has the nature of the devil in him you say where will this fellow spend eternity if he does this to me and does this to her and does this to him where will he spend eternity you begin to pity him you don't hate him if you hate him, you allow his evil to overcome you, to overwhelm you, to crush you, and to take grace away from your life. But if you pity him, then you overcome the evil with good. While he's doing some bad things, you say, how can I do good to this man? How can I do good to this woman? How can I pray for this man? How can I pray for this woman? If you do that, then the evil will not have any effect on you. And then you overcome all the evil that you do against you. You'll be an overcomer. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 21. First Peter chapter 2 verse 21. Even he, for even here unto what ye called. Because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example. Leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin. 
Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. That's Christ. He was sinless. He was pure. He was holy and righteous. And then it says, there was no sin found in him. All the same. You know this kind of world in which we're living in? They don't only oppose bad people. They oppose good people. They don't only oppress sinful people. They oppress righteous people. This world in which we're living in. But then Jesus Christ has passed through this world too. And when he was reviled, he could have reviled them. He knew their lives. He saw them. He knew their hypocrisy. He knew their shallow religious attitude. He knew all about it. And he had the vocabulary. He had the language. We, we have the language. We, do, didn't we go to school? All the bad, bad words in the dictionary. We know them too. All those bad things that they can say and throw at us. We know those vocabularies too. Jesus knew those vocabularies too, but he never used them. They reviled him. And then the temptation for you will be, ah, you think you know how to talk and hurt somebody and then make me feel like I'm not a human being, all right? I know those words to you and then you throw those words at them. No, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that despitefully use you and persecute you. And it says that you will pray for them. Don't use those same words at them. You know them, but don't use them. In verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. He threatened not. He had the power. He threatened not. He had the position. He threatened not. You know, there are some people that are always, you know, they are threatening. They said, leave him alone. When I get up and I want to act, I know what I'll do against him. He will, he will understand. He will understand that he's been dealing with other people. He comes to deal with me. Ah, that man is going to learn the greatest lesson of his life. Coming to touch me. If that man does that again to me, I will show him my power, my position. Don't do that as a child of God. Jesus didn't do that. He could have done that. He said, I could have called 12 legions of angels from heaven. And my father will straight will give them to me. And then he said, but who are you looking for? They said, Jesus. They fell to the ground. He said, get up. I'm the one. Here is my hand. And they led him away. And that's the life he wants us to live. And then on the cross, he began to pray for them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And it says, but he committed himself unto him that judges righteously. In First Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 8. Finally, be, be ye of one mind, have compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil. You see that? That's a child of God. Not rendering evil for evil. Not trying to dream evil for evil. Just, just, just do good. Just say good things about those people that say bad things about you. But contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there, there unto called, that ye shall inherit a blessing. You will inherit a blessing. The Lord is telling us if we follow the way of the Lord, not the way of the world, not the way of anger, the way of revenge, the way of retaliation, the way of fighting back. If we follow the way of the Lord, the blessings of the Lord will be upon our lives in Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 and 44, sacrificial love, point number 3. Sacrificial love in evangelizing the enemies. Sacrificial love in evangelizing the enemies. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Ye have heard that have been said, thou shalt, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. 
the Lord was telling his own disciples, don't think that life is going to be a bed of roses. Don't think that as you go through life now, because you are born again, because you are now a child of God, because you now have the grace of God, the love of God within you, don't think that everybody is going to love a gracious man, a good man, a kind man, a compassionate man. You know, sometimes we have that wrong impression that now I'm born again. And I don't do the things I used to do. Now I help people. Now I wish the best for everybody. Now I go about touching this life and touching that life. And they are the better for it. We seek because the grace of God and the goodness of God and the gentleness of the spirit. We seek because all that has come upon our lives. Everybody will love me not. No, the world is still the world. The world is still the world. And the world will hate you because you belong to me. If you are of the world, the world will love its own. But because you are not of the world, I've chosen you out of the world. And you behave like me. That's why they will hate you. And if they did that to a green tree, what do you think they'll do to a dry tree? If they did that to the king of kings and the lord of lords, was all the good he did. Think about it. Everywhere he went, he healed the sick. But later they said, crucify him. Everywhere he went, he blessed the people. Look at these 5,000 people sitting on the ground. What are they going to eat? And then Jesus looked up to heaven. He distributed the food to them. And they all ate. What a glorious, gracious thing. Jesus, but they still hated him. They still hated him. Don't think because you are now a child of God. And because you are not doing well. You are a blessing to the lives of people. You think because of that, everybody will just fall for you. And they just love you. No, the world doesn't operate like that. They're still going to show that hatred. That opposition. But even when they do that, here is what Jesus said. Verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's the word of the Lord. But what kind of prayer are we going to pray for them? What's the highest prayer you can pray for an enemy? That the Lord will give him material things. That's a great prayer. That the Lord will bless his family. That's a great prayer. But the greatest of it all. That the Lord will not only bless this man on earth. This man that hates me. But that the, this man will see Calvary. Will see the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Will come to realize. That he's not persecuting me. He's actually persecuting my Lord. Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? I pity this man. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. This man is not just hurting me. He's hurting me because of who I am. You know, think of a preacher. You know, if the preacher were not a preacher, if the preacher were just a tailor somewhere, he has a shop and he's sewing dresses for people, the kind of persecution he has as a preacher, he'll not be having that if he were a tailor. Think of a preacher and think of a real child of God that is going through some turbulent time. And it's because of who he is and what he does. If he were to go to be a farmer and then he goes to his farm early in the morning and then he plows the field. He comes back and brings all the potato and the ground nuts and the, and the vegetable. The kind of persecution he has, he'll not be having that. They persecute you because of Jesus, because of who you are. They're doing it to the Lord. Therefore, you pity them and say, Lord, look at these people. Look at what they're doing to Christ in me. If you are here, this is what they'll be doing to you. But because you are not here, you represent, I represent you. That's why they do that. And you say, where will the enemies of Christ, where will they spend eternity? That's why you pray for them. And the, kind, the greatest prayer you can pray for them is that they will get to the kingdom of God. They will repent. Look at this in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. But God commended his love toward us In that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us You are praying that this sinner, this enemy Will know about the death of Christ About the love of God And then he'll get to the kingdom of God Much more than being now justified by his blood 
we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies who were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more be reconciled, he says we shall be saved by his life. The greatest prayer you can pray for them is for them to be saved. For them to turn around. For them to repent. And for them to be conscious of who Almighty God is. And to look to God who says, look unto me all you the ends of the earth. And be ye saved. For I am God and there is none else. In Romans chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. For my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. These were the people that, that were persecuting him. These were the people that there were about 40 people. At a, at a particular time, they bound themselves with an oath, with a curse, that they will not eat until they killed Paul. Those were persecutors. Those were enemies. And yet, he was saying, I wish myself, it, if it were possible to be a curse from Christ, that they might be saved. Pray for their salvation. In Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Those were his enemies. Those were his persecutors. Those were the people that dragged him before Felix, before Agrippa. And they said those terrible lies against him. And then when they said, Paul, can you answer for yourself? He said, I'm surprised at what they are saying. That if they will tell the truth, I was in the temple a few days ago. Neither did they see me or Timothy or Titus with me doing anything against the law, against the temple, against the altar. All this they say, I'm surprised. Those who are enemies. And yet he said, my prayer to God for them is that they might be saved. You see, the greatest good you can do for those people that persecute you is to so demonstrate the gospel. Is to so live out the gospel and is to so present the gospel with your lips, with your mouth, with your, with your life, with your language, and with your message the message of evangelism and reach out to them that they might be saved. First Corinthians chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity, necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel, verse 19. For though I be free from all men, I have made myself servant unto all. Can you think about that? I'm free from all men. I'm saved. No guilt, no condemnation. If I were to go to heaven now, I'll just go. If I one time you said, I'm in a straight between two. Having a willingness to depart and to be with Christ. Which is far better for me. But he said, no. I also have to be here to preach salvation to these people. But Paul, these are the people persecuting. Yes, I know. These are the people opposing you. Yes, I know. These are the people hurting and harming you. Yes, I know. But they need the salvation message. And God has given me this message of life. And that's why he said, although I am free from all men. And I could, you know, just be free. And yet, he went into those same places where they hated him. And then we're told, in that verse, in that verse 19, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. In verse 20, unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law to them that are without law, the Gentiles, as without law. I go to their means, not be, not being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak. And then he said uh, to that I might gain the weak, I have made all things to all men, that I might by, uh, by all means save some. And that's the word of the Lord. And that's what the Lord is telling us that we're to do. And now he tells us before I close, this love that we're talking about. Number one, this love is kind and merciful. What are you to do as you go back home? 
You pick out the people that made themselves your enemies. You pick out the people that maybe you know, they have acquired hatred, accumulated hatred in their heart against you. And you have to be kind and merciful. Luke chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 35, verse 36. Love is kind. Love is kind and merciful. But love your enemies. Do good, do good and lend. Hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of your of the highest, for he is kind. Love is kind. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your father also is merciful. Look up here. If you go around the world and you interact with people, if you look at them, there's one word that will drop out of your life. One week, you'll dry up. There'll be no mercy. L look at them in the bus, if you look at them. Look at them in the market. Look at them in your community. Look at them all around you. If you are not looking up to the Lord, mercy will dry up from your heart. The world is so merciless. But God is still a merciful God. And he says, be merciful as your father who is in heaven is merciful. While they are showing the negative trait of their father, the devil, you show the positive trait of your father, God in heaven. Number two, love is sincere and honest. Love is sincere and honest. Not hypocritical, not shallow, not superficial, not just saying it without doing it. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation, without hypocrisy, without pretense, without superficiality. Let love be without dissimulation about that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Number one, love is kind and merciful. Go out and, and be kind to people. Just be merciful to... Don't, don't think about what they do. Don't meditate on what they do. Don't act on what they do. In spite of what they do, go beyond and be kind and be merciful. Love is sincere and honest. Number three, love is courteous and respectful. Love is courteous and respectful. If you, if you live in this world, and you do, and you see the people around, nobody has any kind of politeness for any other person anymore in, in this society, in any society in the world. It's the survival of the fittest, the survival of the strongest, and the survival of the sleekest. That, those who are sleek, those who are clever. That's the world. And the world is a rat race. And they're all running. And they push the people in front of them down, clear out of the way. They want to get there now. That's how the world is. And you don't run like that with them. Just show some pity and be courteous and be polite. In First Peter chapter 3, First Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love us, brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. If you live in the world and you hear the language, language of disrespect and the action of impoliteness, but it says now that we have launched this. Here are the practical terms and the practical conditions and the practical ways in which we show the love to our enemies and to the people around us. You are kind and merciful. You are honest and you are sincere. You are courteous and respectful. But number four, this very important, love is fearless. Love is fearless. We're not blessing those enemies because we're afraid of them. We're not doing good unto them because we're afraid of their hatred. We're not uh, blessing them when it causes us because we're afraid. Because, you know, we feel the world is strong. The enemies are strong. And these people of the world are strong. No! Christ is mighty within us. 
And we are strong in the might and the strength of the Lord. We have God living within and we have Christ living within and the power of the Holy Ghost abides in us and the promises of God that are yes and amen, they abide within us. Love is strong and fearless. In First John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4 verse 18, there is no fear in love. If you love those enemies, you'll not be afraid of them. You'll not be running away from them. You'll get near to them. And you look at them and they will see the love of God in your eyes. They will see there is no trait of fear or cowardice within you. And you love them with the love of Christ. The cross gives power. Look at Jesus on that cross, on that little mountain, that little hill of Calvary, and see him hanging there, and see him as the enemies were coming. And he said, if you are the son of God, come down in strength. He abode, he still stayed on that cross, and then his strength, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That strength, when you're able to forgive, is a strength of character. The strength of love you're not afraid and then you know they took him that he was buried on the third day he rose again and when he rose again he appeared in jerusalem appeared everywhere then he told his own disciples wait in jerusalem don't run away from jerusalem where i was crucified love is strong and fearless you stay there you don't quit your accommodation because of the wife of the landlord, because of those co-tenants. And you don't quit the ministry. You know, sometimes we have some local pastors, they quit the ministry. And we say, why are you not in your pulpit? Why are you not preaching? Who oh, says, I don't understand. I have enemies in the community. I come to the local church and then I see the way they look at me and the things they do. They hate me and I cannot stay in that place again. Come on, be strong. Love is strong, bold, courageous, and fearless. And you go back there to declare the love of God. And you know, if you hate, you're weak. If you have anger, you're weak. But if you have love, the love of Christ makes you strong. And it says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Number five, love is truthful. Love is truthful. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 But speaking the truth in love You know those who tell lies Is because uh, they are fearful You don't love the people you tell lies to You don't You're not of the same mind with them You're not of the same with, with, with them When you have love You'll tell the truth Speaking love The truth in love May grow up into him in all things Which is the head Even Christ Number 6 Love is corrective love is corrective you know love is not a siding evil love is not, okay i love everybody let the thieves go on stealing let the liars go on lying let the sinners go on sinning i love all people no it's not like that love is bold enough to confront evil you do it in love, but you do it all the same. We're looking at that Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, reading from verse 7, 17 rather. Leviticus 19, verse 17. It says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Rebuke thy neighbor. That's love. That's love. You know, you will not say, if I, if I talk, more hatred will come. Come on, be strong. You know, if I correct them, they're going to misunderstand. I've not even corrected them and see the things they're saying about me and what they're throwing to me. All right, if they want to continue in their evil, let them continue. If they go to hell, that's their business. Get up. 
is strength and show the strength of love. Love is corrective. And it says, you will in any wise rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Love corrects wrong. Yes, we love. Yes, we love. We bless them. We do good to them. We pray for them. We correct them. In Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So love is corrective. Love does not compromise with evil. Love does not say, I'll be quiet. Let the house be on fire and be burning. Let the young people be doing evil and then face the judgment of God. I love, I love, I just smile. No, there are times love will have to confront those evil things. Number seven, love is active with faith. Love is not inactive. Love is not impotent. Love is not just quiet when there's something good to do. Do something positive, something practical. Love is active with faith. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor circumcision, but faith which walketh by love. Faith which walketh by love. The Lord has taught us today and the Lord has reminded us that those Pharisees and false religious people, they incorporated the attitude of the world of hatred in their religion. And they said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But the Lord Jesus Christ, the king of the kingdom, he has told us, enter into the kingdom and live the life that is the kingdom life. I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. We can do it. I said we can do it of the grace of God within us, of the power of the Lord within us, and with the reality and the truth of the world within us. We'll leave this place and go back home and pick out those enemies one by one. And then we'll begin to bless them, do good to them, and to pray for them. Let's rise up and let's tell the Lord today, we have learned from the word of God. And we've seen what he wants us to do. He wants us to have the nature of God and the character of Christ. And he says, love your enemies. This is the mark of a true child of God. In the world, they will say evil things about you. Don't reply with their own words. In the world, they will do evil things against you. Don't act to them like they are acting to you. They might curse you. They might insult you. They might belittle you. They might assault you even. Don't do what they did, what they have done. Give yourself to the Lord and taste of the grace of God that comes at salvation. And let this salvation of God become practical in your life. That then you go back home, you go back to your community, and then you live a different life as a child of God ought to live. Don't increase the hatred in the world. There's too much hatred in the world already. Introduce some love. 
Decrease the hatred. Decrease the animosity. Don't increase the malice in the world. There's too much malice in the world already. Don't increase the wickedness in the world. Too much wickedness in the world already. And a fire of revenge. Too much burning in the world. But now you have the grace of God in your heart. Too many people are angry. Show some love. Too many people are wicked. So show, show, show some compassion. And too many people are fighting one another. Show some peace. And say, Lord, I will be different. Become different. Show that you have the grace of God in you. The truth of the Lord in you. And the power of the Lord within you. Love is strong and powerful. Hatred is weak. And fearful. Love is fearless and bold and courageous. Don't hate. Just love. And if we are to show so much love to our enemies, how much love are you going to show to your wife? Practical love. If we are to love our enemies, how much love are you going to show to your husband? Uplifting love. Profitable love. If we are to show so much love to enemies, how about our children? How about our parents? How much love are we showing to our parents and our children? Let there be love and peace in our families. How much love are you showing to your mother-in-law? To your father-in-law? To those relatives? How much love are you showing to them? Be strong. Love is fearless, bold, strong, and courageous. If you have hatred, you are weak. If you keep malice, it's because you are weak. Come into the kingdom. The strength of the character of Christ manifest it. Be sincere in your love. Not hypocritical. Be honest in your love. Not dishonest. Be courteous. Be polite. Be respectful. That's love. That enemy respect him. Some of those enemies have some high position. Respect their office. Some of those enemies have some wealth. They even have some intelligence. They even have some, have some property. And they even have some good, good things around them. In spite of their hatred. God has sent them rain and sunshine. And their farm is producing well. Respect them for who they are. Don't worry about their hatred and persecution. And love is truthful. If you love the love of God in you, shed abroad in your heart, you'll be truthful. It has nothing, it has nothing to do with lies, deception, hypocrisy when you have love. And love is corrective. You don't want them to perish. You tell them the final consequence of their action when you have a chance to do that. Love is active. Don't fold your hands. Sit back. Become indolent. Become idle. Become passive. The world is too bad. You do good to them. They do evil to you. I'm not going to do anything anymore. Rise up and do good. Don't worry about their reaction. I saw up and do good. Love is active. Active with faith. And love is bold and fearless. There's no fear in love. No fear in love. Those enemies cannot do anything to you. The parameters of your life are determined by the almighty God. The peak, the sinners. The height of your life is determined by the Almighty God, not by any man. Don't fear them. Just love them. 
Love is fearless. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Go back home and demonstrate this love of God.